Church, I hope you had a great day. I hope you're having a great night. For everybody online, welcome. We're, hope, we're glad you're here, and we hope that you also, uh, if your living rooms are relaxing or uh, wherever you might be watching, we hope that you have a great time tonight as well. So let me begin with just a uh, word of prayer, and then we're going to get into a few announcements as we get started tonight. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together, and I thank you for uh, just all that you've done for us. Uh, Lord, what a it's the day that you've given us. It's the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And so tonight, I pray that you would bless as we look at your word, as we look at, uh, again, just this idea that we want our lives to matter and we want to be productive. Lord, please guide us in that. So, Lord, in all things, please be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, thank you, Ken. If you have your... Um, uh, Bible's out. Here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to give you a couple of announcements. Uh, we have a special video. So I want you just to, if you want to write a couple of notes down, just to kind of remember or pray for our missionaries here in a second. One of them has sent us a video. So let me give you our two or three announcements uh, as we get going tonight. First of all, men's prayer breakfast will be February 27th. That's this Saturday. And uh, it'll, be a, it'll be kind of an unusual one. We have the a speaker coming from Habitat for Humanity. And they are going to talk about the Mandeville's home and the building of that and the whole organization. And so, men, if you are interested in helping with building one of our members a home or you're just interested in the entire ministry, come out. It's going to be a great time. Uh, he's going to do a great job, I'm sure. And so we will see you there. The second announcement is Camp at the Wilds, July 19th through the 24th. That is a date change if you signed up earlier. But uh, the same things apply $50 deposit, you can sign up by March 1st. See Carol Moore if you're interested. Her number's on the screen there. Uh, and then our third announcement is the encouragement team meeting. We are going to be, uh, we started this in January, but the whole, well, February, but the whole COVID thing broke out. So we haven't actually got to meet and just get on the same page. So this meeting will be for those of you who have shared interest, or if you're interested now and you want to come to the meeting, feel free. That's going to be Sunday, the 7th of March at 145, right here in the sanctuary. You can spread out as much as you need. And uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about what the heart of that's going to be and any process kind of stuff we need to go over with you at that meeting. It'll be great. And then the fourth announcement is... The video. All right, so here it is. This is Dwayne. Let's Thank pause it just a second, Keith and I'll and your intro it. Here today. All right, there we go. This is Dwayne and Valerie Keith. They serve us in Australia, and uh, they're going to just give a little intro video. I'll come up at the end, and kind of we'll pray for them specifically. All right, thanks, John. We've been in Australia for nearly 20 years, and we've been in Western Australia going on six years. We truly have been blessed being a part of the ministry of Michael and Tammy Nelson here in Western Australia. In 2019, it was probably the greatest year we've ever had. Had a number of people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and they were baptized. We moved over into our new location and our attendance grew by 100 people. Now the increase continued until the pandemic hit. Because we're an island nation and Western Australia is isolated from the rest of Australia, our premier was able to lock down our borders. No one could go in or go out. In addition, hard restrictions were put in place which meant that we could no longer meet as a church. We, like every other church, had to get creative and beef up our online presence. Because of the hard borders, and after a few months, we were able to open up our church once again. Currently, we have no community transmission, and we also have no one in hospital due to COVID here in Western Australia. However, it did take a toll on our ministry. Many people have gotten out of the habit of coming to church because our churches were closed down, and when we reopened, they continued to stay home. They continued to continue on with their pursuits that they did while we weren't having church. And so many have gotten out of the habit of coming to churches. So it's had a tremendous impact. And so this next year will be a rebuilding year for us. However, we are off to a good start. We were able to have youth camp and had 150 people there at youth camp and 11 kids came to know Jesus Christ as savior and many rededicated their lives to Jesus Christ. This past year, we were also able to bring Kel Begley on our staff for full time. He was a young man that was over our youth departments for a, a few years, and now we're able to bring him on, and he has been an absolute blessing to our ministry here. He has also been working very close with the council, and they wanted to expand their programs in order to reach 
more youth in their community and they've been watching our church and they've been seeing how we've been having uh, a wonderful impact on the youth here in our community and so now they want to come together with us and they want to partner with us in order to run some programs for the whole shire now this will give us a wider outreach into our community and also increase our church's reputation among the larger community as well and so I really don't have any idea what's going to happen in the near future regarding that. Uh, God is just opening up opportunities after opportunities. They are endless, but our answer is always, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, whatever you would have us to do. Thank you for being a part of our ministry here. You've been with us for a very long time. You're truly a blessing to us, and thank you for your prayers and your support. So please stay safe. God bless you all. Guru from now. All right, the only thing I want to add, Valerie has had surgery, uh, and uh, so we're just going to pray, of course, for all the different ministry opportunities, but also she's recovering well, and just want to kind of give you guys an update on that as, uh, also. So let's go ahead and bow just for a word of prayer for them specifically. Heavenly Father, Thank you for Dwayne and Valerie Keith. I pray that you would bless as she continues to recover from surgery. Thank you that it's gone so well already. And now, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just bless their ministry. Bless them as a couple. Give the, continue to give them good health. And uh, Lord, we pray that as they reach out into their communities, they reach out to their friends, their neighbors, uh, co-workers, just all around. Give them guidance, give them direction, let them know exactly what you would have them do, and may you give them the strength and the ability to do it well. So for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. At this time, we're going to go ahead and sing, so if you will, stand to your feet as Curtis comes to lead us.
keep in prayer for, uh, yes, Brother Rick. He had surgery on his hand, and thank you, Jim, for filling in. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely, and I think, isn't it true, Vita, he's going to have his other hand worked on next? In about three more weeks. Okay, three more weeks. Well, we'll continue to pray. And uh, for those of you online, just to be clear about how tonight's going to go, we're going to uh, look at God's Word first, and then at the end, we'll kind of break away from you guys and do a prayer time here. So at the end of our time together, feel free to take a few moments and uh, just pray for the needs that you know about and uh, just lift them up to the Lord. We don't want to skip that. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. 15. Tonight we conclude our series on productivity. And uh, we've looked at a number of different things, but um, as you turn there, I'm going to put on the screen a number of books that I think would be helpful to you. There are books upon books upon books to go to if you're wanting to learn more. These are just a few of the ones that I have read and so can recommend. I would say if you had to get only one, Matt Perman's book, What's Best Next, would be the one to get. Uh, it has the best part about how the gospel transforms your productivity and uh, what you do with your life. Number two, uh, on a, oops, sorry, number, the second one there, Michael Hyatt's Free to Focus, very practical. Uh, it was a very good help to me at the end of last year after some of the things happening in our family. Uh, the next two are also great, Do More Better. Um, I don't really care, never mind, it's fine. Uh, they can do what they want. Uh, do More Better, it's a practical guide to productivity. That's by Tim Chalice. You can't really see the name very well, Tim Chalice. Uh, that was probably the first one I read, and very good if you're looking for some tools and how to use them. And then the one that kind of kick-started this journey was Everyday Matters, A Biblical Approach to Productivity uh, by Brandon Crow. His is, if you need a small one and you just want kind of a little bit of all of the other books, just get that one. Okay, that's the best overview that's combined all three of those in a small one, um, one little book there. So those are resources you can go to, and I think they'll be a help to you. And just wanted to let you know that most of what you hear is not original with me. It's from them, and they're quoting other people who quote other people, and on and on it goes. So there you go. But we're, tonight we're going to conclude. Okay, we're going to conclude with what we're doing. So let me just remind you of where we've come from. We begin, Christian productivity begins with this idea of rest. And the reason why we begin with rest is ultimately the gospel does not teach that you do good works and you fulfill your productive abilities and you become the absolute most efficient, most effective person you can be and thus God loves you. The gospel is there is only one person who has ever done the ultimate good work that you and I needed. And that person was Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again the third day to save you and I from our sins and to give us new life and a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God himself. And if you're in John 15, it says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are, already be you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches." Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So you get the idea, right? He's the vine. He's the one you need. If you're going to trust any good work, it's his good work, not your own, not my own. It's his work that we rest in. And then because we have a relationship with him and because of the good work with which he's done, now you and I can be free to do good works. And uh, the, the normal week where we begin with Sunday, a day of rest, 
and then we conclude our week with six days of good deeds, that really is how you should look at all of your life. You do not come to productivity saying, yes, I'm going to be good and God's going to love me more. You come saying, I've received all the love God has ever wanted to display to the entire world. And because I've had all of that, now I'm just going to go around and do as much good as I possibly can. So Christian productivity begins with resting in Christ. It's based on his work of grace that we produce our own good works. And then you do this best through areas of responsibility. So instead of trying to kind of start with some blank slate and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the best great work is. Well, you know what? Jesus has said, and the Bible has said, honor your father and mother. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your Uh, husbands, children, obey your parents, just all around relationships and family issues. He's also said uh, that you should take care of yourself. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So don't neglect reading. Don't neglect your physical health. Don't neglect anything that you've been given, right? Like David and Daniel and Solomon are all praised. Even Jesus grew, right? He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. He talks about work, You're not to work just to be seen by others. You're to work even when the boss isn't looking and you're to do your best and you're to do it because uh, as unto the Lord and not unto men. On you go. You can take care of your home, take care of your finances, take care of your projects and then your community, right? You're not just to love yourself and you're not just to love those who love you and you're not just to love friends that be, because they're your friends and you're not just to serve those because you think they'll pay you back one day. You are to love your enemy and you're to love the poor and you're to love the widow and the fatherless who could never reach back to you because that way you are like your father who is merciful to the just and the unjust. So don't, you don't have to figure out what's my, what, where do I need to go to be productive? You just, you're already living it. Just look at the good deeds that you can do around you every day and then do them. Now from there we said, uh, just in review, you have to take these areas and you have to schedule them. So if you don't set your own, if you don't schedule your priorities, then uh, somebody else will set them for you. So you take out a calendar, an empty one, you set your ideal week. So if Friday night is family time, you protect that. You've already got, a, you've already got something on the schedule. You can't go off with the guys. You got family night. Or vice versa, if this is work time, you can't go pick up kids. It's work time. You got to do your work. Or uh, if it is personal time, you can't go get coffee. It's workout. You got to work out. So do your thing. If it's, I don't know, you fill in the blank, right? You set your own life you set your own schedule. You prayerfully consider all those things. Beyond that, you boil that down. This was last week. You just pick three major things you want to do in the week and three good deeds you want to do every day. Okay? So for me today, it was uh, finish the sermon. It was have a very important phone call. And third was exercise. That's not done yet. So when I go home, that's my third good deed. It's leg day. I'm just avoiding it, right? But we got to do it. So um, beyond that, we're going to today's time. What do you do with all the good deeds you didn't have time for? What do you do with all the areas of life that there are good deeds to be done, but they, they're just left undone, right? You, you can't do it all. Only God gets his whole... Uh, list of responsibilities done. Only he ever finishes his to-do list. You and I will always have deeds left undone. So I want to give you four ways in which you can get the, un, the good deeds undone, get them done. Here's the four. It spells dead. I was trying to think of an interesting way to uh, do this, but maybe that'll help you kill some undone deeds. Okay, that's the best I got. So uh, here are the four. You can delegate, you can eliminate, you can automate, or you can defer. Delegate, eliminate, automate, defer. Uh, There is a need for each one of these in your life. And if you had to put them in order of importance, delegate becomes the main one. So we'll probably spend a little more time on this than anything else. Matt Perman writes it this way when it comes to delegation. He says, freeing up your time For what is most important is not merely about eliminating, 
There are things that need to be done and they ought to be done, even though they are beyond your individual capacity. In other words, God has given you a mission to do more deeds than you have time in your life to do. You catch that? God has given you more things in life than you have time by yourself to be done. So he goes on to write this. The first step in learning to reduce these good deeds is to reject that you have to do them all by yourself. He says, productivity is not an individual matter. What this mentality will end up you, will end, sorry, what this mentality will leave you with is isolation and burnout or pride, all of which is not pleasing to God at all. So, we don't want to do that. God has given you more than you can handle. God has asked you to do more than you could ever possibly get done in a day. And yet, you only have 168 hours in a week. What do you do? The first option is that you delegate. And delegate is not simply getting rid of tasks that you don't want to do. I think that's the normal way of explaining what you delegate. It, says, it goes like this. Delegation is presented as a way to serve yourself. You get rid of some things you don't want to do. It might go something like this. Uh, you delegate things that are unimportant or they're lowly or they just don't fit your, your little wheelhouse or you don't enjoy them. The aim of delegating is not to just make your life better and free up all of your time and load up other people. There's a different mission for it, okay? One of those things, you can see those. Those are going to be some of the applications we'll get to in a minute. Um, Delegation is going to be all throughout the Bible. Think of Moses and his father-in-law Jethro. Remember that one? Moses is meeting every need of the people. He's answering every question of the people. And Jethro comes to him and says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. Divide up the people. Let's set heads of houses. Get it all the way down to where there's leaders of thousands and 550 and 100, you know, all the way down so that you spread the load. Give the people something to do so that they don't all have to come to you. David in 1 Chronicles, they will give David's organizational skills chapters 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Anybody ever read the making of the tabernacle where God says to Moses, Moses, I don't want you to build it. Go get these other guys. They're going to build it. Tell them this is what they need to do. Anybody ever read that? It's, it's kind of it's draggy. Agree? You get in the middle, like, you get through Exodus, the first part, and there's, like, plagues, and Moses is doing stuff, and they come through the Red Sea, and all of a sudden they get to Sinai, and you're like, yes, Ten Commandments! And then after all that, it's like, all right, this is how I want you to build it, and this is the size, and this is the type of goat hair, and, like, it just keeps going. You're just like, come on. That's all delegation stuff. So if you think that this thing, this idea that you're to share and spread the load is not significant... Moses does it. David is going to organize the Levites, the priests, the musicians, the gatekeepers, the treasurers, the military divisions, the tribal leaders. Each one of these is almost given its own chapter. If you make it through 2 Chronicles, Solomon will spend nine chapters delegating. Actually, it's not quite that much. It's chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, delegating the construction of the temple. Jehoshaphat will spend chapter 19, Joash chapter 23, Hezekiah 29, 30, 31. Jesus will spend numerous positions and times sending out the disciples, sending out 70 disciples. On and on and on it goes. They are, dis they are uh, delegating responsibilities. All of the New Testament letters of Paul are letters telling church leaders what to do and asking them, all right, I'm delegating this to you. Run it. So don't look at this as dirty and don't look at it as things that you don't want to do. These are things that you absolutely should do. And here's why this one is so good. Delegation allows you not just an opportunity to have other things done, but you get to build relationships. So unlike eliminate and automate and defer, which really kind of stays in your own mind, delegate allows you to get more good deeds done 
and you get to have new and better and deeper relationships with people. Anybody ever had some of your best? You, I mean, you, you guys are here tonight, and if you're watching online, you've been in churches. You can have a relationship with somebody as you're worshiping, right? But share in a ministry. Share some delegated responsibility over a nursery, children's church, choir, some type of missions trip. And that connection grows so much deeper, doesn't it? That's exactly what happens. So God is absolutely pleased as the need for delegation and the need for organization and the need for all of that increases and as complexity increases because that just means you need more people to get interconnected and those relationships get that much better. So in your life, when you feel absolutely overwhelmed and you think, I don't know what to do, I'm just going to eliminate everything and throw it out the window or I'm going to turn to technology and try to automate my life away, Stop a second and see if there's anything you can do to help delegate first. You don't just gain efficiency. It'll be slow at the beginning. You've got to train somebody else how to do something. But as you do that, you don't just gain efficiency. You gain a whole nother brain to help you solve problems. And then you make a friend. You deepen a relationship. And that is uh, incredibly powerful. So let me just read this, just these two things to you. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know that verse, don't you? Here are the next verses. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many they may be saved. Paul says, I want to do as absolute much good to as absolutely as many people as I possibly can. And to do that, he needed Titus's and Timothy's and Luke's and all the other people that traveled with him around the world. He didn't try to do it as a solo guy. And you and I should not either. Uh, there's two ways, two types that are spelled out to delegate. One is go for delegation. And the other one is stewardship delegation. Go for delegation is what my dad did when we tried to rebuild an old car. Go give me that. Go give me that. Go give me this thing. Go get the 916th wrench. Go get the, hold the light, man. Hold it. Don't pay attention. What are you doing? What are you aiming it up all over the place? That's go for delegation. You know what happens in go for delegation? The gopher gets tired and bored. And they don't grow. They just kind of do what they're told. Some people like this, but... It's not the best. It's just do the task I'm telling you exactly like I tell you. Don't think, just do. And there's, there's probably time for that. Um, but the better way is, is stewardship delegation. You give somebody an entire area of responsibility and you say, solve the problem. It's yours. Uh, many of you here, that's pretty much how we run all of our ministries, right? So Vita runs our kids' choir, and I just say, Vita, it's yours. Run with it. If you need help, if you need resources, please let me know. But other than that, it's hers. Curtis, he has the choir, right? Uh, Jerry McGee right now, men's prayer breakfast. And we don't bother you. We try really not to bother you. We let you do it. Um, stewardship delegation it allows you to serve, and it allows you to build up relationships, but it also allows competence and capabilities that the people didn't even know they had until you give them the opportunity. So if you're going to do it, that's the way that we would want to do it. Now, I want to show you just a few things about stewardship delegation. These come from Stephen Covey in his book, First Things First, and he says there are five things that you need to give somebody as you delegate to them. You tell them the desired result, right? Uh, what do you want to see accomplished? You put some guidelines in. You make sure that they have all the resources that they might need. You give some accountability. In other words, you don't just like throw them to the wolves and say, all right, I'll check with you on December 31st, 2021. Uh, well, have a great year. Depending on their maturity, you set very specific, you know, desired results. You give them a whole lot of resources. You meet with them a lot to make sure the thing gets done. And then you praise them a lot because, uh, or you, the consequences would be praise, of course. You, you praise them a lot, right? They need a lot of encouragement. The more mature somebody is, 
the fewer desired results you get. You have very few guidelines. You make sure that they know that you're there for them, but they can find their own resources. You meet less frequently, but all of this kind of leads to, you know, all those consequences, more responsibility, promotions, uh, financial rewards, just encouragement, and on and on you go. So that's delegation. Okay, so think of your life, think of all the good works you've got, home projects, work things, church stuff, personal responsibilities, everything in there. Is there a way to delegate that well? Okay, I want you to think about it. Number two, here's your second option for good deeds left undone that you just can't get to. It's elimination. Elimination is going to kind of get broken down into two major areas. Number one, things that uh, don't need to be done. You can eliminate them. You just don't do them. Or number two, you can eliminate parts of tasks that must be done. All right, so they're a little different. Let's start with the first one. This first one is this idea that you eliminate things that don't need to be done. Um, it's often described as the 80-20 principle, which it's, it's pretty well known across most business stuff, and maybe just in your own life you know this as well, that 80% of your effectiveness will actually only come from about 20% of the time that you spend. So take your whole week and probably the 80% of the great things that you're going to do this week will be done in about 20% of the time. The rest of the 80% of your time, you're eating, you're brushing your teeth, you're checking email, you're returning a phone call that really didn't need to be made, you're responding to this person that got upset about that thing, and it's really, you're not producing anything, you're just kind of, you're just existing for this other 80%. And what the principle says is simply this, as much as you can, give more attention to the 20% of your life that produces the most effectiveness that you can. So, uh, you, can uh, you can see this almost across the board in life, right? So I would say that um, John MacArthur isn't going to every hospital visit. He's spending time preaching, studying, and writing books. That's the 20% of his time that makes him as effective as he possibly can be. And you would be the same way. Just imagine where the best quality of your effectiveness, and if you don't know, ask your friends, ask your family, ask your children, ask a spouse, ask somebody. There, there is a space in your life where you are absolutely crushing it. And 80% of all the great things that you do come from that about, about that 20% of your time. So when possible, get really used to saying no. And here's a great thing that I, I'm still learning because I say yes way too much. Every time you say yes to something else, you're saying no to everything else. You get it? So if somebody says, hey, can I have an hour of your time? If I say, yes, you can interrupt the study that will go out to hundreds of people and I will give you this hour, I'm saying yes to that person and no to everything else. At times, that's exactly the right thing to do. And at times it's not. In your life, there are times when you should go out to coffee with friends and there are times that you should not. There are times when you should work out and there are times when you should say, no, I got to break this tradition, this habit right now because there's this other thing that's so much more important. And only you get to know that. But that's one of the principles. It's the same principle as gardening, right? You, uh, you're out there, you got some type of garden, and whether it's peas or tomatoes or cucumbers or flowers, there are times when you need to weed the garden because you want all of the attention and all of the nutrients and all of the resources going to the few things, not everything else. Sculpting would be the same way, right? Michelangelo took a piece of marble and he cut away everything except what the masterpiece was left with. So take your life, and I think it's probably easiest to take the things that you've wasted time on and eliminate those. That's probably the easier time, right? So if you waste a lot of time on your phone, if you waste a lot of time at night just watching television, if you waste a lot of time in your car, you know, whatever it would be, just eliminate them as best you can. The second point is this, eliminate parts of tasks that they have to be done, but you want to shrink the amount of time that you give to them. So uh, this is best given by a guy named Parkinson. Um, it's, it's his law where he says you want to, the law is 
your uh, task will take as much time as you give it. So if you give yourself an hour to check email, it'll take you an hour to check email. If you give yourself an hour for whatever, it normally will fill, you'll fill your hour with whatever that deed is. So things that you don't really want to do, things that have to be done, but you don't really want to spend a ton of time on it, you limit that time and you're done. That's it. Um, th those are great ways to handle life, right? If you don't put these things in things that you love, you should not limit the things you love or that you're really great at. But things like what I've just mentioned, checking email, responding to phone calls, time and meetings that you have to go to, whatever, just set the time parameter so that you're done with them and then move on. If you're going to say, look, I want to stay up on the news, fine, set 30 minutes to watch the news. Don't spend four hours watching the news, which is half commentating about the news that hasn't happened. So just wipe that out and just start over. Just do something else with your time. So that's what I mean. You're eliminating parts of tasks that don't need to be done, so you're just shrinking that. A word on elimination, though, and I think this is important. You don't eliminate everything. A couple of examples. The whole point of the Good Samaritan story is that the priest sees a hurt guy but he's focused on his efficiency and his effectiveness and he's got things to do and they're, not, they're, the, they're the most important things only he can do and he walks right by the guy. Levite comes by, does the same thing. The Samaritan comes by, stops, helps his neighbor and he's praised for it. So this doesn't mean you lock yourself away and you get this like tunnel vision. What it means is you, you focus the amount of your time that you have. And when God brings in these interruptions that are not part of your planning, you've got enough already built-in structure that you can handle those things really, really well. Think of the time when Jesus was uh, going to heal uh, Jairus' daughter, right? She's dying or almost dead or she even gets, she dies as he's walking to her. But the lady with the, you know, the blood disease comes and touches the hem of his garment and he stops the entire thing. He is running to an ER situation with a child and he stops for a lady who's got an un, you know, it's a non-fatal blood disease. And he stops the entire thing and he turns around and he has a conversation with her and everybody's looking at him like, what are you doing? This is not the most important, effective time. You can do this later. Jesus says, no, right now is the right time. I'm going to handle this. I'll take care of that thing as well. Is it important? Absolutely. But I've been interrupted, and I'm going to make the most of this interruption. So even though it's a good habit to not do things you don't need to do, and it's a good habit and a good, pro a good practical kind of thing to work through areas of your life where there's certain tasks that can be squished and done quickly, don't eliminate everything else from your life. You might miss attaining and being hospitable to an angel unaware. There's just a thousand different possible things that can happen. So don't do that. Just be careful when you look at elimination. All right, number three, automation. Automation, it comes in in three, I'm going to focus on three different ways, okay? Self-automation is your routines. We talked about this when we talked about scheduling as well, but uh, automation is putting your tasks on autopilot so that they happen on their own without you having to think about them. So, um, um, good examples would be any type of ritual for yourself. So when I talk about self-automation, these are things that you do. So I mentioned before, I eat the same thing for breakfast. Mary and I have the same routine getting the kids to school. And so before nine o'clock, I really don't have to think, which ironically frees me to think. You might think routines would kill your creativity, but in fact, the idea that you're doing the same thing and you don't have to think about it and it's automatic in your life and you're just, you've self-automated actually lets you have the most creative time that you possibly could. Where are the two places you have the best ideas? Do you know? In the shower, you just automate it. You're not thinking about that. You're not thinking, should I wash the left arm or the right arm first? <laughs> oh, I gotta make a decision. I hate making decisions. You just do it. You have great ideas when you brush your teeth. You have great ideas when you drive. You have great ideas when you mow the lawn. 
You might have great ideas in other ways, but wherever those kind of light bulb, oh man, I just solved that thing. It's when you're automated and you're not having to think about anything. And your brain can kind of just kind of float around and do what it wants and all of a sudden God just gives you whatever, right? So, automate as much as you can. There's a good book on that called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Atomic Habits. You can look that up and he, can, he talks through different things like that. So, just free yourself up by automating as much of your kind of daily ritual stuff as you can. Number two is process automation. These are your tasks. Every week, I have to record my mileage every week. I got to turn in receipts every week. I got to, you, you know, so I just have a task that says, you know, update these things. That way I don't have to think about it. It's just a process. It's, it all happens on the same day. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's just done. Some of you might have cleaning processes, right? Monday is laundry. Tuesday is vacuum. Wednesday is dust. Thursday is, I don't know, mother yard. Friday, I should have written this down. You get the idea, right? You just have this list of things. You got your thing you're going to do every day. You do it. Great. It's done. You just, you've already kind of process automated it. The key for some of these things is the combination of them. So, uh, especially for me at this stage, we're about at the stage where we can help our kids learn how to clean a toilet, how to wash the car, which is going to eliminate it from me, delegate it to them, and in the process, I'm going to tell them through a process how to do it. It's fantastic. Um, I don't have to do all that anymore. So, as Ella gets older, a little bit older, she can't quite reach the top of a car, but I'll say, Ella, this is the process for how I want you to wash the car. You're going to start up top, don't wash my wheels first, and then take that dirty rag and scratch my paint all over the place. Start at the top and work your way down. Spray at the top and work your way down. I'll get to do that. So, just do that with as many things as you possibly can. Um... If you have a, you know, it, it goes, it's anything. It can be your Bible reading. It can be your, your financial life. It can be your family. It can be your wife. It can be whatever you want. If there's certain processes you know you have to do all the time, go ahead and start automating those things. It'll really help you. And the third one is tech, right? These are the tools that you actually use. A good example, I think the best one would be uh, just online bill pay or automatic bill pay. You set, you let the tech do the work. You set in that every month you have an electric bill and you have a water bill and you just have it, pay it. You don't have to think about it at all. It's absolutely off your mind unless your lights go out and you realize you hit delete at some point and you got to go back and fix it. But uh, that's never happened to me. So just tech automate that stuff. You can use, use this as much as you possibly want. When it comes to, um, yeah, that's enough. And then third, or fourth now, sorry, uh, defer. Defer is simply, if you're not sure what that word meant, it just means to put things aside for later. This is what we go to automatically. This is what I go to automatically. Oh, I need to do that. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. I'll do it next year. It just keeps going back because that, this one is the default view. And it's probably your default view. And it's when this list, you know, this list in your mind of I need to do this and this and this and this and this that I've deferred from the past and I just haven't had time. When that list gets so big, that's when you get overwhelmed and burned out. So instead, do make a list of things that you need. You, only you can do it and you got to do it later. But after you've made the list, set an appointed time for that item. So if you say, oh, I need to call Jack. Instead of just putting on the list, call Jack, just write a time beside the name. And you'll be amazed at how just making a time for it actually helps you get it off the list. It's, it really is quite amazing. So instead of just, you know, when you're driving, of course, don't do these things, but you can talk to your phones now. So, you know, just, hey, remind me to whatever at this time or tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, whatever. It, it's really, really great. So um, that's all I have for you. So if I had to boil it all down, I would say it just like what Jesus has said here in chapter 15, verse number five. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now go to verse 8. Here's the last one. Well, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If you're a Christian here today, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you were 9, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80, you are never going to be more saved than you were at that moment. So the only reason why you are still on this planet is to do good works, is to bear fruit. And this whole, se this whole series has only been about helping you focus so that you can do the most good, you can produce the best fruit you can possibly do. So I hope it's been helpful to you. What we're going to do, Pastor Ray has some handouts for you. What it has, uh, for those of you online, you have to make your own for tonight. It'll probably be in the show notes on YouTube eventually. But on the left side of the page, just take out a piece of paper, write down a list of a gazillion things you can possibly think of. On the right side, make four columns, delegate, eliminate, automate, and defer, and just put a check mark by each task of what you're going to do with it. So everything from cleaning to dishes to cooking to fitness to working out to eating right to, you know, serving in some capacity at church to whatever it is, write down as much as you can possibly think of in your life and then decide some of these good deeds I'm going to do. But for the rest of them, I need to delegate that thing and I need to automate that thing and I need to defer this thing and I need to eliminate this thing. Just, do, just let it be a resource to you. So online, we'll see you later. God bless. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Uh,